हेलो एवरी वन टूडे वी विल रीड अबाउट डिस्ट्रैक्शन ऑस्टियोजेनेसिस बिफोर वी प्रोसीड और बिफोर वी स्टार्ट विद अंडरस्टैंडिंग व्हाट इज डिस्ट्रैक्शन ऑस्टियोजेनेसिस वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड बोन हीलिंग ओके देर आर टू सिचुएशन इन विच अ बोन नीड्स टू हील फर्स्ट इज एन एक्सीडेंट विच कॉज इज बोन फ्रैक्चर और सेकेंड इज एन इलेक्टिव कट इन द बोन विच इज कॉल्ड एन ऑस्टियोटमी ओके सो देर आर टू रीजन इन विच वी विल हैव अ बोन दैट नीड्स टू हील फर्स्ट रीजन इज अ बोन फ्रैक्चर एंड सेकेंड रीजन वेर अ बोन नीड्स टू हील इज ऑस्टियोटमी मीन्स अ फ्रैक्चर अ वेरी प्लैंड फ्रैक्चर दैट इज क्रिएटेड बाई दी सर्जन फॉर सम पर्पज आइदर इट कैन बी फॉर ऑर्थोग्नाथिक सर्जरी और इट कैन बी फॉर डिस्ट्रैक्शन फॉर वट एवर रीजन इफ इट इज अ प्लैंड कट इन टू द बोन इट इज कॉल्ड एन ऑस्टियोटमी वेन इट हैपन्स बाई एक्सीडेंट अ हे वायर्ड फ्रैक्चर देन इट इज कॉल्ड अ फ्रैक्चर ओके इन बोथ दीज सिचुएशन द बोन नीड्स टू हील ओके so bone healing happens by two means what are the two ways in which bone healing happens first is the primary or the direct or the cortical healing this is the first way in which bone healing can occur the second way is the secondary bone healing through callus formation okay we will slightly go into the depth of the two types of bone healing primary bone healing is uncommon very uncommonly we will see primary bone healing it happens when the gap between the fracture fragments is less than 1 mm okay so when the gap between the two fracture fragments is 1 mm or less than that then maybe you can have a primary bone healing when there is absolute immobility between the fracture fragments when there is absolutely no movement between the fracture fragments only then you can have the primary or the cortical type of bone healing and when will this happen this happens only with a rigid fixation what is rigid fixation we will discuss when we are discussing about trauma for now just remember that primary or direct bone healing is uncommon type of bone healing it happens only when there is less than 1 mm gap between the bone fragments and when there is absolute immobility between the segments when we are rigid thick rigid plate is put across the fracture fragments and bicortical screws are placed when there is absolutely immobile then there will be primary bone healing secondary bone healing it is a much more common way of bone healing earlier it used to be thought that primary bone healing will give a better quality of bone by compression by rigid uh, fixation by immobilization compared to secondary but it is not true both kinds of bone healing will give the same amount of strength to the bone in the post healing phase okay so both are equally good secondary is the more common type it happens when the gap between the fracture fragments is more than 1 mm and when there is some mobility between the fracture usually if you do a close reduction or if you do a semi rigid fixation there is some mobility between the fracture fragments because of the muscle pull because of the teeth so there is some limited mobility okay if there is more mobility it will go for a non union or a fibrous union that is not normal that is not good bone healing healing will happen when there is minimum amount of mobility which comes with close reduction or which comes with semi rigid fixation okay so these are the grossly two types of bone healings that you will see okay now even primary bone healing is of two types primary bone healing can be contact healing or it can be 
gap healing. Okay, so many MCQs are commonly asked in exam just on the base of types of bone healing. Okay, so you have to remember these few things about bone healing uh, very importantly. Contact healing will occur when the gap is up to zero point three millimeters. When you have put your plates and compress the fracture fragments and absolute no mobility is there and the gap is only 0.3 millimeters less than 0.3 millimeters then there will be contact healing what will happen in contact healing bone resorption units or bruise will be formed bruise are bone resorption units osteoclast will be in the front they will start cutting the bone and form a cutting cone in the cut part of the bone the capillaries and the osteoblasts will come and directly they will form lamellar bone okay there will be direct lamellar bone formation means exactly like the previous type of bone in the same direction the lamellae will be formed this will happen when the gap between the segments is less than 0.3 millimeters this is very very rare this to happen okay next is the gap healing which is also a type of primary healing don't forget primary healing is of two types contact and gap don't think that gap healing is a type of secondary healing no gap is also a type of primary healing this will happen when the gap between the segments is 0.3 one millimeter okay and more than one millimeter it will be secondary healing okay here also it has to be absolutely immobile what will happen here is in the cutting cones first there will be woven bone formation and then there will be lamellar bone formation woven bone is like a ball of wool it has all the components of bone but they are not very organized in a lamellar or a concentric way okay so first bone woven bone formation will happen and this will be perpendicular to the existing lamellae so this woven bone will be formed in a direction that is perpendicular to the existing lamellae of bone and after that it will convert into lamellar bone which is parallel to the existing lamellae of bone i will show you diagrams to understand these things properly this is just for you to understand and make notes that primary healing two types contact healing gap healing contact healing the gap is 0.3 mm or less gap healing gap the gap between the segments is 0.3 to 1 mm here directly lamellar bone is formed in gap healing first there is woven bone which is perpendicular to the existing lamellae then there is lamellar bone by remodeling it will be parallel to the existing lamellae okay there is no formation of callus no formation of any kind of cartilage in primary bone healing okay so here there is no cartilage no formation of cartilage no formation of callus okay whereas secondary bone healing happens by formation of callus okay now what is this callus like we have discussed this happens when there is some mobility between the fracture fragments so when there is a fracture in the bone there will be sub periosteal hematoma there will be some bleeding beneath the periosteum this blood will organize and consolidate and form hyaline cartilage and this hyaline cartilaginous structure is called a callus remember students this word is very important callus is very important it is a kind of cartilaginous structure the purpose of this callus is to make these fracture fragment immobile 
stabilize this fracture fragment because there is some mobility because of the muscle pull, because of the ligament pull, because of the teeth. There will be some mobility between the fracture in spite of the semi-rigid fixation or close reduction that you have done. That some mobility also needs to stop for a proper bone healing. So that stability, that immobilization is brought about by this cartilaginous callus. Slowly, this callus will organize into lamellar bone. First, it will form the woven bone and then it will form the lamellar bone. Okay. So, this is the process of secondary bone healing, which is a much more common process, which happens most often when we do a fracture plating, when we do an osteotomy and plate it. So, this is the more common form of bone healing. Alright, let me just explain this again with the help of diagrams. This first image here is the example of primary bone healing. Okay, so this is co contact healing and this is gap healing. You can see that the gap between the fracture fragments is minimal. It is hardly any gap, less than point. 3 millimeters. This happens when a rigid fixation is used with bicortical screws. So, what happens across the fracture site? There is bone resorption units are formed, bruise are formed. There is a cutting cone. The osteoclast will be leading in the cutting cone. Okay, this is the cutting cone. It is led by the multinucleated osteoclasts, which will start resorbing the bone followed by capillaries and osteoblasts which will start laying the lamellar bone directly in case of contact healing. Same thing will happen. See, this is the bone jumping distance. Okay, this is the distance. 1 mm is the distance through which these osteoclasts can jump across. After that, they cannot jump across and there will be secondary healing. So, this jumping gap is only 1 millimeters in case of bone. So, again, there will be cutting cone formation, osteoclasts will resorb the bone, then there will be woven bone formation, then there will be lamellar bone formation in case of gap healing. What happens in case of secondary healing? The fracture gap is more than 1 millimeters, there will be hematoma beneath the periosteum. This hematoma will organize into a fibrocartilaginous structure. It will be composed of hyaline cartilage, some fibers. This fibrocartilaginous structure is called a callus. This is the callus. And this callus will ultimately organize into a mature bone. It will form a woven bone and then it will form a lamellar bone just like the original bone and remodeling will go on for a very long time. Now, there was a surgeon who was called Gavil Elizarov. Dr. Elizarov thought that if I stretch the bone in the callus stage, maybe I can elongate the bone. Okay. This is what Dr. Elizarov thought. So, what he did, he put osteotomy in the bone, he cut the bone into two pieces and waited for this callus stage. As soon as this callus stage was formed, he started pulling the bone segments across. He put some device into the, both the segments and with a key, he used to turn that device slowly, slowly every day and what he observed was this callus started getting stretched. This callus had the capacity of getting stretched slowly, 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 slowly. And as a result, the length of the bone increased. After he got the desired length, he stopped stretching the callus. And just like normal bone healing, the callus which was stretched and elongated, it organized into new bone. And this he termed as distraction osteogenesis. Alright, this is the definition of distraction osteogenesis. This is the process of new bone formation 
by incremental traction between the bone segments simple distraction osteogenesis is nothing but the process of new bone formation by incremental traction incremental means slowly slowly a little bit every day if you suddenly stretch it it will rupture the callus will tear out okay if you do it very slowly then the callus will already organize into bone so there has to be a fixed rate in which slowly slowly incrementally you have to do a traction traction means pulling that is why it is called distraction okay so if somebody is calling your name again and again and again you turn your head and look towards this person you are distracting yourself towards that person that is the purpose of distraction osteogenesis distracting the bone slowly and forming new bone osteo means bone genesis means formation generation so distraction osteogenesis means generating new bone by incremental traction between the fracture segments for new bone formation okay that is the meaning of distraction osteogenesis it was first done for lengthening of the lower limbs so whenever there was a fracture when was whenever there was a mal uh, complicated fracture comminuted fracture or a non union or a mal union and various times the fracture fragments had to be compressed for healing sometimes it was observed that there is limb shortening that is shortening of the limb one limb is shorter compared to the other one so to correct the limb shortening this distraction osteogenesis was started by dr elizarov okay and now it is very popularly used in the maxillofacial region for increasing the length of the facial bones it can be done for mandible it can be done for the alveolus it can be done for the body for the ramus for the condyle for forming new condyle in case of ankylosis it can be done for the mid face in case of cleft patients or some syndrome patients okay so this is the purpose of osteogenesis distraction osteogenesis now when we distract bone we don't take it out of the body and start distracting it it is inside the body and by some machines by some devices we are distracting and forming new bone in the process what is happening is everything is getting stretched the muscles the cartilage the nerves the neurovascular bundle everything the gums the gingiva whatever is attached to the bone is getting stretched and is increasing in length or width that is why the more popular term is distraction histiogenesis it is not just the osteogenesis not just the bone formation but all the tissues all the hard and soft tissues that are attached to these two segments of bone that are being stretched all the soft and hard tissues will form will be stretched and will be elongated so that is why the more proper term is distraction histiogenesis okay the biology behind the process is distraction histiogenesis but we usually call it distraction osteogenesis because our purpose is to increase the length of the bone okay and who was the surgeon who gave this term because very commonly it is asked in exam that name the surgeon or name the person who was the first one to give distraction osteogenesis like discussed it was dr gavril eli zarov most of the principles of distraction osteogenesis are by the name of elizarov's principles so it is dr elizarov that you have to remember was the scientist who gave distraction osteogenesis now what are the indications why do we have to do osteo uh, distraction osteogenesis you can simply do an orthognathic surgery you can cut the bone and stretch it or put it in the desired position wherever you want and put a plate but that is not always possible so the indications for distraction osteogenesis are facial deformities beyond the scope of orthognathic surgery orthognathic surgery has some limitations there will be relapse there will be relapse and distraction also but most of the, def the deformities that are 
very very um that are too much to be uh, done corrected with orthognathic surgery they are taken care of by distraction osteogenesis and remember distraction can only add to tissues it can never subtract it can never take the tissue go back there can never be a setback by distraction osteogenesis okay this is common sense whenever there is a setback or reduction procedure involved you have to do orthognathic surgery whenever there is an additive procedure you can do either distraction or orthognathic and whenever it is too much say if you have to take the mandible 15 mm ahead or 17 mm ahead it might not be possible with a small mandible so in such cases you might have to go to distraction osteogenesis okay second is in cases of cleft in cleft patients what happens is because of the palate surgery cleft palate okay not cleft lip uh, in cleft palate cases in cleft palate cases when we operate the cleft palate to close the gap or close the communication between the oral and the nasal and the sinus cavities then it causes a scar in the palate this scar prevents the growth of maxilla in a very full fledged manner so there is a restriction of maxillary growth after cleft palate surgeries and this causes maxillary hypoplasia so in cleft palate patients after growth is completed you can correct the maxillary hypoplasia by distraction osteogenesis third indication is in patients of tmj ankylosis we will discuss again when we are doing cleft uh, in cleft chapter we will discuss again when we are doing tmj chapter but here also i have to tell you the indications for maxillofacial distraction osteogenesis so in tmj ankylosis once you have cut the ankylosed bone okay so this is your mandible this is your glenoid fossa and this is your joint in tm joint ankylosis what happens this is new bone is formed this is the ankylosed segment now what you will do you will put a cut in the bone and remove all this bone okay now what is left behind only this much bone is left behind the patient will be able to open the mouth but whenever he opens the mouth because the condyle is missing here there will be deviation in mouth opening so to correct that deviation you can just distract this bone for a new condyle formation so another indication for distraction osteogenesis in the maxillofacial region is tmj ankylosis okay fourth indication is the dento alveolar defects okay suppose there is uh, some height of the alveolus is not proper width of the alveolus is pro not proper body of the mandible is not wide enough for whatever dento alveolar defect suppose you have to do a complete denture in this same patient and here because of some defect the height is this much what will you do you can distract the remaining bone and form new bone so for dento alveolar defects for maxillo mandibular defects for maxillo mandibular body defects for all kinds of bone defects you can use distraction osteogenesis okay so say for example this patient has met with an accident and few teeth are missing and because few teeth are missing some bone is also missing now i feel that i have to reconstruct this mandible using implants what will i do i will take this bone i will take it up and i will form new bone i will give you image examples later on so that you understand this better and later on i will have this segment moves up and i will have good new bone formation and in this new bone i can put my dental implants okay so for any kind of dento alveolar defects i can have distraction osteogenesis next is for continuity defects for example this patient has this big tumor he has an ameloblastoma and it needs resection okay what will i have to do as a surgeon i have to resect this much mandible i have to cut this away okay 
this is my mandible and there is an amyloblastoma here so i have to cut this i have to cut this part now this much mandible is gone okay what will i do i will put a plate i will put a plate here i will put a plate here and you are restoring the continuity of mandible but he doesn't have teeth i want teeth he says i want teeth what you can do either you can take a graft from somewhere from the iliac crest from the fibula a flap or a graft and you can reconstruct the bone but that will give an additional donor site additional surgery site you will have to do one more surgery in the iliac crest or one more surgery in the rib if you want to do a rib graft if you want to do a free fibula flap you have to do one more surgery in the leg to harvest that fibula what you can do is you can make cut two bones and distract these two bones and form new bone from the same site without any additional donor site you can generate new bone so that is the indication of distraction in continuity defect you can how you do it i will tell again but this is one of the indications that you need to remember that for continuity defects whenever there is a loss of continuity or discontinuity defects you are you can use distraction osteogenesis and one more indication is in obstructive sleep apnea what happens is obstructive sleep apnea is most of the cases either the tongue is very big tongue is falling back the mandible is very short the mandible is retrognathic and because of that the airway is very narrow so you can do a maxillomandibular distraction or just a mandibular distraction and you can take the whole mandible ahead this will open up the airway space in the pharynx and you can have improvement in the obstructive sleep apnea so there are endless indications of distraction osteogenesis broadly speaking these are the conditions in which we use distraction osteogenesis all right so to understand distraction we need to understand the ilizaro effects so what are the two ilizaro effects this is a little going into the deep but sometimes in sr questions these effects are asked so at least a brief i am telling you about them first is the tension stress effect and second is the effect of blood supply and loading tension stress effect is nothing the same thing that we have discussed that when the callus is given slight stress when it is given tension tension is always a pull effect compression is a push effect okay so tension is a kind of stress that pulls the tissue apart so in the callus stage when we give slight tension to the callus it causes growth it causes growth of tissue this is the tension stress effect that if a correct amount of tension is given in the correct way in the correct amount then it will cause growth of tissues growth of bone growth of soft tissues growth of all the tissues surrounding the area where tension is given and the effect of blood supply and loading if you give this tension and there is no blood supply to the tissue it will only cause necrosis whereas if there is good blood supply so that means when you are doing the osteotomy when you are putting the cut in the fracture in the in the in the bone blood supply should not be disrupted to an extent that it does not supply the callus you have to take care that there is adequate blood supply so that growth can happen if blood supply is not adequate the same thing will fail and if blood supply is adequate it will help in growth and the effect of loading if you create this tension downwards the bone will be forming downwards if you give this tension upwards the bone will be forming upwards so vector or direction of growth will depend on the direction of load what gives load to the callus the muscles the pull of the muscle will give loading will load or will pull the callus in the desired direction how can we as surgeons control this direction by controlling the vector you can use elastics 
we will tell you as i give examples by elastics inter uh, arch elastics you can control the vector and you can control the loading in this segment so the loading and blood supply will decide the shape of the uh, the bone which is formed okay if i do a very fast destruction and immediate loading then my if, if, if this is the bone that needs to be formed and this is the callus that is being stretched okay if i stretch it too fast then what i will get is an hourglass shaped bone i will not get a good uniform bone width okay so it has to be very slow so that is the these are the two ilizarov effects that is the tension stress effect causes growth of tissues and adequate blood supply and loading will decide the shape and the uh, the health of the destruction regenerate okay so these are the ilizarov effects so when we cut the bone when we do osteotomy and till the time we form a new bone out of it there are five stages or five periods of callostasis okay callus is the thing that we are molding from secondary uh, healing we have got the callus and this callus can undergo five has to undergo five stages for new bone formation okay these five stages are very 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 important they are very commonly asked in neat and ini exam rate rhythm vector of destruction all these are very commonly asked questions so please understand this very very carefully what are the five stages of callostasis the first stage is the osteotomy the second stage is the latency third stage is the destruction stage fourth stage is the consolidation and fifth is remodeling these are the five stages in which callostasis happens what is osteotomy it is the surgical separation of the two bony segments okay so this is a bone you are cutting the bone in between this is called an osteotomy what do you have to remember in osteotomy there should be minimal periosteal stripping when we discussed about secondary healing we saw that a sub periosteal hematoma is formed if you do excessive stripping or excessive dissection of the periosteum this hematoma formation the blood supply to the bone will be disrupted okay so you have to remember that whenever you are doing on osteotomy the edges in periosteum should not be dissected a lot okay so that is the first step in callostasis is a very planned a very neat cut into the bone wherever you have to do the cutting so that is the osteotomy stage second is the latency latency is the time from osteotomy to the start of destruction okay this is the period in which you allow the formation of callus okay if you start destructing immediately you have not given the bone enough time for callus formation so in secondary healing first there will be bleeding then there will be organization of the blood clot then will be formation of fibrocartilaginous callus this callus formation happens during the latency phase how long is the latency phase it is 3 5 7 10 few days after your osteotomy time of latency depends on many factors it depends on the age of the patient it depends on the blood supply of the area it depends on the health of the tissue surrounding tissues a lot of factors so suppose i am doing destruction in an infant who has obstructive sleep apnea because of peri robin syndrome okay i will just give a one day latency or a two day latency period because the bone healing is so fast in an infant in a newborn that if i give a longer latency period the callus will already have formed bone and it will lose its stretching ability once it is uh, calcified so in infants 
the latency is one to two days only, even zero days. We have seen in our centers in Ames and Mamsi that in infants, even zero day latency is given and immediately next day you start distracting because the bone healing properties are very, very good in young age. For an adult, on an average, if it is an adult who is undergoing destruction, seven days is usually what we leave for latency. Okay, so if a broadly it is asked to you that what is the duration of latency or what is the latency period in a normal adult, it is seven days. In a healthy adult, it is seven days of latency. In seven days, there will be formation of a fibrocartilaginous callus that is ready to be stretched. Okay, so in average, it is seven days. If it is a very old patient who is diabetic, who has some immunocompromise, where you expect the bone healing to be slow, Maybe it is 10 days, maybe it is even longer. Okay, you usually do not do distraction in such patients. Just for an example, I am giving you. Okay, and in young patients, in children, it can be less than 7 days. But for adults, for healthy young adults, on an average, the latency period is 7 days. Okay, next is the distraction phase. Distraction is the, from the start of traction to the Stop of traction. It is the period in which you actually pull or distract the callus at a particular rate, at a particular rhythm. Okay. So, in distraction phase, two things are important. First is the rate of distraction. Second is the rhythm of distraction. What is the rate of distraction? Like we said, in a healthy young adult, the number of days of latency is 7 days. Similarly, on an average, if you are, if you are asked a general question, the rate of distraction in, is 1 mm per day. In craniofacial distraction osteogenesis, the rate of distraction is 1 mm per day. And what is the rhythm of this distraction? The rhythm is 0 0.5 mm twice daily. Okay, this is the rhythm. Rhythm means the frequency. Rhythm is basically how frequently you are doing that distraction. Okay, auto distractors are also uh, discovered or also invented by some scientists that it will keep distracting the segments very very slowly so that in 24 hours it is distracted by 1 mm okay auto distractors are also there but more commonly we are using the rhythm of distraction that is two times in the whole day you will turn the distraction device and every time by one full turn it will distract the bone segments by 0.5 mm so 0.5 mm in the morning 0.5 mm in the evening brings a rate of distraction to 1 mm per day Okay, and what is the rhythm? Rhythm is 0.5 mm twice daily. Suppose it is done for an infant. Infant, like I said, or a very young child has very good rate of bone healing. So maybe in an infant or in a very young child, I will do it 2 mm per day. Okay, and the rhythm will be 0.5 mm 4 times a day or 1 mm twice a day. Okay, this can be the rhythm for a rate of 2 mm per day. But this is only for very, very young children whose healing capacity is very strong. On an average, for exam point of view, you only have to remember that a rate of distraction on an average is 1 mm per day. And rhythm of distraction most of the cases is 0.5 mm twice daily. Okay. So, this is the distraction phase where you actually um, stretch the bony segments into slowly, slowly traction and move them apart. Now, consolidation is the phase when you stop your distraction and wait. So, don't remove your distraction device. If you remove your distraction device immediately after distraction, then the callus, which is not very firm, will bend, it will be deformed, okay? So, you have to wait for consolidation of the callus into a strong cortical bone. 
cortication in x-ray is a sign of bone formation. Okay, so consolidation is the phase from end of distraction till removal of distraction device. Usually it is for six weeks. Okay, usually in six weeks, uh, there is cortical bone formation. Some books call it six weeks. Some articles say it should be three times the distraction period. So, for example, if you have done a 14 millimeter distraction at the rate of 1 mm per day, that means in 14 days, in two weeks, you have done your 14 mm distraction. So, consolidation should be 2 into 3 is equal to 6 weeks. Usually, it is three times the length of the distraction period. Okay. On an average, it comes to around six weeks. In around six weeks, the callus is strong enough that it has formed cortical bone and now you can remove your distraction device. So, consolidation period is the period from the end of distraction to the time a cortical bone is formed and you can remove your distraction device now. And remodeling is after removal of distraction device. Okay. After you remove your distraction device, the body will do remodeling itself. This is not in your hands. The body will keep on changing the shape, keep on doing some remodeling here and there depending on the muscle action, depending on the, cart, uh, the ligaments that are attached to the bone and remodeling will go on slowly, slowly for years together. Okay. Usually till one year. So, these are the five stages of callostasis. They are the osteotomy phase, which is the cutting of bone without much of periosteal stripping. The latency phase is the phase where you have to wait for a callus to form between the two fracture fragments, which is usually seven days. Next is the distraction phase, where you distract at the rate of one millimeter per day by the rhythm of 0.5 millimeters twice daily. Then is the consolidation phase, which is usually the three times the amount of distraction phase usually six weeks, where you don't remove the distraction device, you let a cortical bone formation. And last is the remodeling phase, which happens after removal of the distraction device and it goes on for a long time. Okay. So, these are the five callostasis periods. Now, just to explain you the same thing again, look at this diagram. Okay. So, in this patient, an osteotomy is done. The distraction device is fixed like it is fixed here and there is a key which is coming out here. Turning the key every day at the rate of 1 millimeter per day, 0.5 millimeter in the morning, 0.5 millimeter in the evening, I have stretched my callus and this new bone is formed. Okay. And this new bone, it will consolidate into a proper lamellar bone. Distraction device is removed. Okay. Look here, these are some clinical cases that I will show you and then your concept will be a little more clear. For example, see this first case. In this case, the alveolar ridge width is less. Okay, this is a very, very small distraction device that I have placed. I have put an osteotomy cut like this on my alveolar bone. And I have put my distraction device across the osteotomy cut. This is the point from which I turn the distraction device so that it opens up just like an hyrax. It will open up slowly, slowly and ultimately this is the new bone formation. I get this much good width of alveolar bone and now I can do my prosthesis here in this alveolar bone. Similarly, in this case, look, this ridge has lost a lot of alveolar bone. I cannot do a good RPD, I cannot do a good implant, I cannot do anything in this kind of bone. Okay, so what I do is, whatever residual bone is there, I put one, two and three cuts. Okay, this is my residual bone. This is my alveolar bone. This is my residual alveolar bone and this is my basal bone and mandible. So what I do is, I put one cut, two cut, 
and three cut. So this is my one segment of bone where I put one of my one part of my distraction device. This is the second part of bone, and this is the key which is coming out. And I turn that key every day. This is the key. Slowly, 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 I turn that key. So this is the first part. This is the second part. I turn that key and slowly, slowly, slowly see. This is the upper segment of bone. This is the lower segment of bone. And this is the new bone which is formed. Okay. And this, when I remove, look at the ridge now. Look at the beautifully increased height of the alveolar ridge from here, from this to this. Can you see? Can you appreciate the difference? And now, this is all the new bone which is formed. See, this is the upper segment of bone. This is the lower segment of bone. And this is all the new bone which is formed. Okay. And because of this, I have a good height. I can place my implants. So, this is alveolar distraction osteogenesis. Okay. Now, coming to the vector of distraction. Okay. Sometimes image based questions are asked showing you multi vector devices or single vector devices. And you are asked to identify the device or what kind of a device it is. Okay. So, vector is basically the direction of distraction. Okay. If the direction is a single direction in which the bone is formed, then it is called a single vector or a unidirectional device. It can be a dual vector or a bidirectional device or it can be a multiple multi vector or a multi directional device okay so single vector will form bone in one direction a dual vector device can form direct bone in two directions and the multi vector device can form bone or can modulate the direction of bone formation in more than two or say three directions. Okay, basically it is more than two directions. Okay, for example, now look at this child. So, in this patient, we had to distract the angle of mandible and increase the height. So, say this is the mandible and I feel that I have to increase this region, okay, because of the deformity, I put my osteotomy cut here, like this, I put my device here, one pin of the device here and the device comes out like this and here is the key, if I turn the key, then this segment goes like this this segment goes like this, but this segment will not move much because it is attached to the condyle here. Okay. This segment is relatively freer to move this segment. Okay. So, it will pull when I turn my device at the rate of 0.5 mm twice daily or 1 mm per day, then this segment, which is the tooth bearing segment, this will move downwards. And slowly, slowly, there will be more bone formation. Okay. So, the direction in which bone is formed is a single direction. Only one cut is there. And uh, when I turn, do my distraction, it is only one direction in which the distraction device can move. And only a single direction in which bone is forming. So, this is a single vector device. This device is a single vector distraction device. Look at this image now. These are two separate distractors, but if these two distractors were connected like this, okay, there was one key here, there was one key here, okay, and I have given my cut here. If I turn this key, it grows in this direction. If I turn this key, it grows in this direction. Then it is called a dual vector device. 
ओके टू वेक्टर्स टू डायरेक्शन ऑफ ग्रोथ ओके यर वॉट दे है सिंगल वैक्टर डिवाइस two devices are put it doesn't make it a dual vector device in this image they have used two single vector devices to increase the length in two directions what is used more commonly now is this multi vector device okay so this is a single vector device i cut the bone i put the distractor i turn the key and this moves in a single direction so this is a single vector device this is a multi vector device what they have done is they have connected the arms and there is a angular controlling device here so when i fix this into my same osteotomy into this osteotomy i can increase the length of the ramus i can increase the length of the body and with this pitch screw here i can change the angle of my osteotomy matlab uh, medial to lateral superior to lat uh, inferior positioning also can be changed so the callus can be moved in three directions with this device okay anterior posterior medio lateral and supero inferior or the turning or the torquing so because of this hinge which is here you can control the direction of the callus in multiple ways that is why it is called a multi vector distractor this is the most commonly used distractor in most of the big deformities that we see okay either this or this the single vector device these are the most commonly used distractors in maxillofacial region okay so coming to the classification of distractor devices it can be either an internal device or an external device the only difference is that the external device comes out externally extra orally okay so like we have seen earlier if this device of course it has to be placed into the bone but if the pin comes out externally it is called an external device if the pin comes out intra orally it is an internal device okay internal devices are a little difficult to put because there is limited space in the oral cavity okay the limitation of internal device is that it is there is limited space and in all cases you cannot do an internal uh, distraction like for example this is an external device the pin is coming out extra orally whereas the earlier alveolar distractor that we saw here and here they are internal devices they are fixed intra orally but they are socially more acceptable since the patient has to be with the distractor for a long time 2 weeks of distraction 6 weeks of consolidation around 8 weeks or 2 months he has to be with the distractor so it is socially a little less acceptable external device internal device is socially a little more acceptable and it will give no facial scar since it is not coming out externally it will not give a scar and these are the disadvantages of external advantages there is Uh, you can place it anywhere there is a there is no limitation of space no space constraints and it is always possible to put an external device it is socially a little uh, awkward to move around with that distractor and it will give a facial scar because any incision on the skin will always give a scar okay so again giving you examples this is an internal mandibular distractor okay osteotomy is done the distractor arms are fixed the pin is carried out intra orally as you turn the key from into the mouth the distract the distractor key uh, the distractor uh, planes are separated and distraction happens so this is an intra oral single vector mandibular body distractor okay very simple intra oral or internal single vector because only in one direction the bone will form mandibular because are applied on the mandible body distractor okay now see this patient in this patient we had to do bilateral distraction along with the lefort one osteotomy which is done in the maxilla okay one of the distractors we could manage to put intra orally so this distractor is placed intra orally but this distractor has come out externally okay because there was no space to put the distractor intra orally so we had to do so this is an internal distractor there may, might be an image based question see because of all the orthodontic brackets and all it is a little difficult to appreciate but you can see this pin coming out 
so this is an intra oral or an internal distractor and this is the extra oral distractor so this is this side it is there was no space to put it intra orally so we put it extra orally so because this is uh, coming out through the skin there has to be a skin incision it will give some facial scar and she has to move around like this so this is the disadvantage of an extra oral distractor or an external distractor okay now coming to a very important part which is transport distraction okay this brings us to focus of distraction also you can do two types of distractions you can cut the bone okay you have done the osteotomy you can fix your distractor and you can move the bone separate the bones this is normally what we have discussed till now so this is one focus whatever is happening is happening here in this end in the single osteotomy site whatever is happening there is only tension happening and this is a single site where everything is happening so this is called a monofocal distraction this is a monofocal distraction only in one site there is tension happening what other thing you can do is suppose this is your bone okay and this much segment is lost like we discussed in the case of ameloblastoma or any tumor suppose this much segment of bone is cut how will you distract what you can do is so these are the two segments of bone that are available to you and this is the gap what you can do is you can cut the bone from here and you can move this piece of normal bone like this you can transport the normal bone so this is already a defect this is already a defect your osteotomy is near the defect will cut cut a segment of bone this is called the transport segment this is the transport segment what you will do is you will cut a segment of bone from any one side wherever you have bone and then you will start distracting this segment like this and slowly 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 with take traction this segment here there will be bone formation in this osteotomy side there will be new bone formation and once this distracted segment reaches here once this segment reaches here you can freshen up this site and you can put a plate you can put a plate like this so that this bone is fused to this bone and this is all the new bone which is formed okay this kind of distraction has two sites of focus one is this site where you have done your traction or tension and one is this site where finally the transport segment will dock where it will stop okay this docking site is the second site where activity is going on okay so this is called transport distraction this is a bifocal distraction there are two focus or there are two areas where something is going on okay one is the osteotomy site from where you put you take your bony segment and you start pulling it towards the other side once it reaches the other side of the healthy bone which is called the docking site it will stop and you will freshen up the margins and you will put a plate so this compression that is happening there is compression which is happening here you are fixing the two bones together so there is traction or tension happening in this region and there is compression happening in this region so two focus or two areas this is called the bifocal distraction okay and this is this kind of distraction is called the transport distraction now there is one more way of doing a transport distraction suppose it is a very big tumor it is a very very big tumor and because of the tumor you have to cut a long length of bone a very big segment of bone is cut okay this segment has to be cut off because of the tumor 
okay this is resected during the tumor surgery okay now you feel that if i take one transport disc from here if i make this my transport segment or my transport disc and if i transport it to the other side it is a very long distance that my transport disc has to travel it needs a lot of blood supply it needs a lot of support to travel this longer distance but because of the tumor surgery i have cut a lot of tissues i have done a lot of dissection i am not sure whether this long movement is possible or not so what i do is i make two transport discs i make one transport disc on one side of bone i make another transport disc on another side of bone i move this here i move this here and in the middle when they join with each other i put a plate and this is the new bone which is formed so there are three focus in this transport distraction one is here one is here where truncation is happening and one is here where the two segments meet and there is compression and i put a plate so this is called trifocal distraction okay bifocal and trifocal distraction come under transport distraction when i make a transport disc i move it till the docking site if there is a single transport disc it is a bifocal distraction if there are two transport discs and they join together in the middle it is a trifocal distraction okay so whenever i create a transport disc and i move it towards the docking site that kind of a distraction is called a transport disc distraction where do i use this i use this mostly in my tmj ankylosis cases okay like i have told before this is my mandible this is my glenoid fossa and this is my temporomandibular joint now because of ankylosis there is bleeding in the joint and now this blood is consolidated and this is all formed into bone this is all a ball of bone that is formed because of tmj ankylosis now in my surgery for tmj ankylosis i do a preauricular incision and i cut and remove this ankylotic chunk okay now when i cut and remove this ankylotic chunk i have a lot of gap what i have done is gap arthroplasty okay i have removed all this bone and now the situation is like this the purpose of tmj ankylosis the patient will be open, able to open his mouth even with a gap arthroplasty but a growing child who needs both sides of the condyles to grow who needs a mouth to open symmetrically he needs that i need a reconstruction i need to build my condyle so what i will do is i will do a reverse l kind of an osteotomy okay i will make this segment my transport segment this part of ramus is become my transport segment and technically we call this an rcu a ramal condylar unit a ramal part a ramus bone which will form the condyle so we call it a ramal condylar unit or the distraction transport segment now what i do is i put my distractor here i put my distractor here i put another distractor part of pin here and it comes out from the mouth now daily i start 1 mm per day after the latency period this transport segment goes up 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 till the time it touches the glenoid fossa this is the docking site so this is bifocal transport distraction for new condyle formation see whenever you read such terms in exam unless you have understood the concept it is difficult but once you have understood the concept it will be like butter you will be able to understand the question so clearly because it is simple english bifocal 
because this is one site and after it has dogged, this is the second site where there will be activity. We will not do a plating here because it is a joint. So, the bifocal distraction, it is a transport distraction because a transport disc is created for what is the purpose? For new condyle formation. So, in children, sometimes there is a residual disc which is left that helps in, uh, you know, shaping the condyle. And what will happen eventually is, eventually, so I take a different color to explain, eventually this goes up and there is formation of new condyle. So, here I have created a very new brand new condyle and it is called neocondylogenesis. This is the new condyle which is formed. This is the transport disc which has reached the docking site. This is the transport disc which has reached the docking site now and this is all the new bone which is formed. Okay. So, this is the purpose of transport distraction osteogenesis in maxillofacial region. Another is like the amyloblastoma case I discussed. Now, I will show you certain examples so that you understand these things better. Okay. So, this was a girl. I think she was from Mamsi and she had TMJ ankylosis. After the surgery, look here. An L-shaped transport disc is created. One part of distractor is here. One part of distractor is on the residual ramus and the pin is coming out externally. Okay, and from outside, as a postgraduate, it was my duty to turn the pin 1 millimeter every day, 0.5 mm in the morning, 0.5 mm in the evening. And I had to do dressing every time, clear the wound so that it doesn't get infected, the pore doesn't get infected. If there is infection, it can go and damage the callus also, everything can get resorbed. So, it was my duty to keep the distraction site, the distraction port very clean. Okay, and 1 mm per day. I am distracting and slowly, slowly this ramal condylar unit or the transport segment, it reaches the, it reaches the docking site, it reaches the glenoid fossa which is the docking site and she does not just have enough mouth opening, she also has a symmetrical mouth opening. You can see the midline is matching, the upper and lower midline is matching when she is opening her mouth. If I had, if we had not done this reconstruction, if we had not done this transport disc uh, distraction osteogenesis and formation of new condyle, then the mouth opening would have been deviated. It would be a teda mouth opening. Okay. The reason why she is having an absolutely straight mouth opening is because you have done a reconstruction also. Okay. So this is one example. Another example. This was a case. I think again from Mamsi, this was a patient with amyloblastoma. You can see the disadvantage of an OPG is that anterior mandible or anterior structures are not very well visualized. Still, you can see there is impacted canine, impacted premolar, some radiolucency you can see here and biopsy, it was follicular amyloblastoma. So, as the rule, you have to do a resection of this much part of bone. Now, when I resect this much part of bone, I gave the option, we give the option to the patient that either we can do an iliac crest reconstruction where we have to cut the pelvis, we have to remove the anterior iliac crest and we have to fix the bone. Since it is a big segment, I cannot make it a non-vascular reconstruction. It has to be a vascular reconstruction. So, I tell the patient that we have to remove a part of your fibula along with blood vessels and a free fibula flap can be done which can reconstruct this but that gives an additional donor site. It is another scar on the leg. So, we give the third option to the patient that you can go for distraction osteogenesis. The only disadvantage is that the distraction device will be there in your mouth for two to three months and after that it will be your own body, your own mandible which is forming new mandible. So, what we do? We fix the distractor. We do a trifocal distraction. We fix the distractor in the same time when we are doing the surgery, we are resecting the mandible. At the same time, we are putting the distraction device and after a latency period of 7 days, we start distracting it at the rate of 7 millimeters per day. And slowly, slowly you can see the distance between the pins is this much and slowly it has opened up to this much. You can very well appreciate in the OPG also 
that this is one transport disk that I have created. This is the second transport disk that is created and slowly, slowly on this recon plate, we are moving the transport segments towards each other. And this is the new bone which is formed by destruction osteogenesis. And once the segments will unite in the midline, I will freshen up this segment so that there is healthy bone and it is not a eburnated margins and I will put my plate. So this is trifocal transport destruction osteogenesis. Okay. And finally, in this image, you can see that the two segments have met in the midline. And why am I doing this elastics? Why have I put this elastics? To control my callus, to control the vector, to control the direction of the uh, new callus that is formed. Okay, if I just don't put these elastic, then it might go down and I'm not sure whether it will take, it will hold that place. So to control my newly formed callus, I'm putting this elastics with the help of arch bars. Okay, so this is another use of destruction osteogenesis. So whenever in exam, this kind of an image is shown to you, this kind of uh, devices are shown to you, please recognize them as destruction devices. Similar case, small kind of a peripheral giant cell granuloma type lesion but it turned out to be an ameloblastoma this uh, ct cut is showing it very clearly to be ameloblastoma kind of a multilocular radiolucency same thing is done we have done the resection we have put a trifocal distraction plate and slowly slowly it is opening up this much it has opened up and you can see this transport segment has moved from here to here and this transport segment has moved from here to here. Since this was an old patient, okay, the kind of shape that is formed is a slightly hourglass kind of shape because maybe a 1 mm per day destruction was too fast for him. His repairability is a little slow. So we could have gone for a 0.75 mm per day. Since 1 mm was a slightly fast for him, the shape is hourglass shape. The same will be normal for the previous patient. The same will be slower for a younger patient. For an infant, you have to do 2 mm per day also. Okay. And when the two transport segments are meeting in the midline, then I am putting my plate. Okay. Now, when an image-based question is asked to you in the exam, many times there is confusion between these kind of images. Okay. So, this is a transport destructor where you can see pins and they are separate. Okay, this is one destructor, this is another destructor. This is an external pin fixation for a commutated fracture of mandible. Okay, whenever the mandible is fractured into many, many pieces and you don't want to do an open reduction, then one of the ways of closed reduction is external pin fixation very rarely used nowadays in india it is very rarely used maybe outside it is used but in india external pin fixation for mandible is very very rare but since the textbooks are showing it i'm wanting to show this picture to you because this might look like a distractor device okay so whenever you are reading the image based question please read the question properly also just by seeing the image don't jump into the answer the, or this is a distraction device no you have to see and probably when the examiner is smart enough to give you this kind of an image he will definitely give you a tree that this patient has met with an accident the mandible is divided into small fragments opening up the fragments opening up to do an open reduction might necrose the segments. So the surgeon has decided to do this kind of a fixation. What is this? Please don't mark it for an distraction device. It is not a distractor device. It is an external pin fixation for comminuted fracture of mandible. It is rarely used but it is a good confusion for an image based question. Okay. So, distractor till now, transport distractor, this kind of transport distractors are not asked in exam. Most of the times, what is asked is the other kind, the first kind that I showed you. And again, I will show you 
and red distractor. Okay. Now, all the distractors that I have showed you till now are for mandible. For mid face or for maxilla, what is used is the red distractor device. Red is rigid external distractor. Okay. What we do? We do a Lefort 1, a Lefort 2, a Lefort 3 kind of an osteotomy. Okay. If it is by accident, it is called a Lefort fracture. If the surgeon is doing it, it is called a Lefort osteotomy. Okay. It is a very controlled cut and wherever you want to move the bone, whichever bone you want to move, that bone you have to cut. Like for example, this is this patient of Cruzon syndrome. I want that this much bone I have to take ahead. This much part of mid face needs to be taken ahead. Okay. So in this patient, I will maybe I will do an osteotomy like this. And I will put my distractor here. And the support I am taking from the temporal region. From the temporal bone, I am putting my twins here in the temporal region for support. And from this support, I will move my maxilla. The, the other part is in the maxillary teeth. Okay, here it is a tooth bond device, tooth and bone bond device. I am putting the distractor pins. I am taking the support from the teeth. And I am moving the whole mid face wherever I put my cut. That whole part is distracting ahead and look how beautifully it is correcting the profile of the patient. Okay. So, this is image based question is asked previously in exam showing this kind of a device and this is a red device or a rigid external distractor which is used for mid face distraction. Mid face distraction, you cannot use those single pin like distractors because it is, you know, fused bones. They are all fused bones. You, you have, you might have to take a part of zygoma. You might have to take a part of, you know, floor of orbit, a part of nasal bone, a part of sphenoid bone from the orbit. So that all, they are all fused bones. They are not a separate single bone like the limb bones or the mandible. So this kind of a device is used for the mid face distraction. Okay. Again, very simply, I will give you some case examples. This is a child, probably a syndromic child, a Pierre Robin syndrome. He has very, very retruded mandible. And you can see here, the tongue is big enough to cause airway restriction. Okay, this thin green part which I am marking, this is all the airway the child has. And when he sleeps, the tongue falls even back and he is unable to breathe. This is called obstructive sleep apnea. So, what I have to do? I have to take the mandible ahead so that the genioglossus, the geniohyoid, all the genial muscles, all the suprahyoid muscles are also pulled ahead and the pharyngeal airway which is very narrow here is opened up. Okay. So, I intubate the patient. How do I intubate the patient? Preferably because it is an intraoral mandibular surgery. I will put a nasal tube, the nasal endotracheal tube can be a simple flexometallic tube or it can be an RAE tube. We will discuss this again. But since we are discussing, I will just mention RAE tubes are preformed tubes into North Pole or South Pole. Okay. North Pole tube will go from the nose and it will curve upwards just like this. So whenever I am doing an oral surgery, if I do put a North Pole tube, it keeps my tube away from the site of surgery. Okay, so Ring, Adair, Elvin were the scientists who gave the preformed tubes, North Pole tube and South Pole tube. Okay, these are the preformed, already the tube is bent. If a normal flexometallic tube I will try to bend, then the tube will kink. There will be kinking in the tube and air flow will be inadequate. But if during manufacturing only, I make the shape of the tube twisted like that, then it will not kink. There is, it is it's away from the site of surgery and there is no kinking. So, in this case, I will use a North Pole nasotracheal tube so that my oral site is clear of the tube. So, intraorally, I do a C osteotomy. I put my distractor. The pin is coming out externally from uh, behind the ramus. I do distraction. I distract the mandible slowly, 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 maybe 2 mm per day because this is an infant. And this mandible which has attachments of all the genial muscles anteriorly, the anterior segment is moved ahead. 
So the tongue, the genioglossus, geniohyoid, all the suprahyoid muscles, they are taken anteriorly and look how beautifully now my airway has opened up. This is all the airway that I have and this has opened up. Sorry, this is the esophagus that I have gone into and this is all the pharyngeal airway that has opened up beautifully just by distracting my mandible anteriorly. Okay, so this is another indication for distraction osteogenesis. Okay, so one more example that I will give you. This is a kind of a hyrax. Okay, what does the hyrax do in orthopedics? The hyrax is supposed to widen the maxilla to increase the width of maxilla before fusion of the palatine suture. Okay, but if we want to do the same thing after fusion of the palatine suture, then I will do a distraction osteogenesis. I will put a hyrax kind of a device which is also a distraction device. I will do my Lefort 1 osteotomy and I will cut the maxilla from between. From I will make it a, a, a two piece maxilla. Okay. And I will put my distractor device like this and I will separate the uh, two parts of maxilla and widen. So, for example, in this case, a very narrow maxilla. I have put my distraction device, I have done my osteotomy and I have done my maxillary widening. This is done very often in cleft patients and this procedure is called SARPE, Surgically Assisted Rapid Palatal Expansion, Surgical Assisted why surgically assisted? Because the sutures have already fused and now surgically you are cutting and putting an osteotomy to separate the two bones. Rapid because hyrax is slow and distraction is 1 mm per day which is quite fast. Palatal expansion. So if this kind of an image is asked in exam, this is a sarpe which is a kind of monofocal distraction. Okay, single cut. The two segments are moved away from each other. This is a kind of monofocal distraction. Bifocal, there has to be one transport disc which is moving. Trifocal, there have to be two transport discs that are moving. Okay. So, monofocal, there is no transport disc, only a single osteotomy and the segments are moving away from each other. So, this is SARPE. So, for exam point of view, all you have to remember is these few questions. What will be asked is these few questions from anything in distraction. If you can answer this, you will be able to answer the question in exam. What is this device? If this device is asked in exam, what is this device? This is a multivector mandibular distractor. Is it a pin fixation device? No, because I cannot see any fractures. I can see newborn formation. So, this is a distraction device. Okay. Where is it fixed? It is fixed in the mandible. Angle of mandible, body of mandible, condylar region, ramal condylar unit, anterior mandible. It is used in the mandible. What is the path of exit? Is the pins intraoral or extraoral? So, this is an external distractor because obviously this big distractor you cannot put intraorally it has to be the pins are going from the skin into the mandible but the whole device is externally the the, the turn segment is placed externally so it is an external distractor what is the direction or what is the vector of distraction it is a multi vector device because it can move the bone up it can move the bone ahead anteriorly and through this Angular device, I can torque the mandible, I can do the superior inferior movement, I can do the angular changes. So, it is a multi vector distractor, it is a monofocal or a transport. There is no transport disc that I have created, there is no transport segment that I have created, there is only one focus of distraction. So, it is a monofocal distractor. Is it a transport distractor? No, it is not a transport distractor because I have not created any transport disc. What is the rate? Average rate of distraction for adults is 1 mm per day. What is the rhythm? Average rhythm for adults is 0.5 mm twice a day. Okay. And what is the consolidation period? 
it is six weeks or three times the distraction period. Okay. So I hope with this you will be able to answer all the questions that are related to this image. Similarly, this one, what is this? This is an alveolar distractor because you are using it in the alveolar region to increase the height of the alveolus. Where is it? It is in the mandibular alveolus. In this image, it is in the maxillary alveolus. It can be used in the mandibular or maxillary alveolar region. Where is the exit path? In this image, it is coming intraorally. The key is coming intraorally. In this image also, the key is coming intraorally. So, it is an intraoral device. What is the direction? It is only increasing the height in single direction. So, it is a uni vector or a single vector device. Is it a monofocal or a transport? It is a transport distraction because you have generated a transport disc. This transport disc is moving up. If it would have been a single cut that is separating, it would have been monofocal. But here you have created a transport disc and this transport disc is moving up. So it is a bifocal transport distraction. Okay. Again, one more device. What is this? This is a rigid external distractor. Where is it used? It is used in the mid-face region. Where is the exit? The whole device is external. The name is only external. So, it is an external device. What is the direction? The direction is anterior. So, it is usually a uni single vector device. So, uni vector device. Is it a monofocal or a transport distraction? You can call it a transport distraction, but the whole segment is moving. What is the rate? The rate is 1 mm per day. What is the rhythm? Usually 0.5 mm twice daily. In normal adults, in children, it can be faster. Similarly, this, this is the most commonly used distractor in most of the centers, at least in India. What is this? This is a mandibular distractor. Where is it used? It is used in the ramus of mandible. Where is the exit path? The exit path is away from the mandible. It is coming out. So, it is an external distractor. It is a single vector device because it can only open the bone in one direction. Is it a monofocal or transport? <clears throat> this is tricky, but this is a monofocal transport because you cannot call this as a transport segment. This hole will not move because of the joint. This whole segment is not moving. Okay, This is a single osteotomy where this is moving. So, you will call it a monofocal distraction only. You will not, if this cut have, would have been like this, that a small segment of bone is cut and moved, then I would have called it a transport distractor. But this is not a transport distractor. This is a monofocal distractor only. Okay. Some questions that are repeated previously in exam. Name the procedure that is being done here. So, I will not just read the first and second option and mark. I will make sure that I read all the options with my finger below the question and then I will mark. Even if, when I am sure that it is the answer A or B, still I will read the answer C and question option C and D also. Management of condylar fracture with IMF followed by external pin fixation of the proximal fractured segment with the ramus of mandible. Is that what is happening? No, because I can see, look in this image, I can see that this segment of bone is away from the remaining segment of bone. How can this be a fracture treatment? In fracture treatment, the two segments of bone should be touching each other. They should be compressing against each other. But since there is gap and this kind of a device is attached, that means it is not a condylar fracture treatment. This is ruled out. Transport disc distraction osteogenesis of bilateral ramal condylar units using mandibular extraoral distractors after gap arthroplasty in bilateral TMJ ankylosis. That is the answer. I have created two transport discs. I can move the disc and so this is the answer. Still, I will read my option C and rule it out because sometimes option B might look better but C might be a better answer. 
So make sure that even when you have targeted A or B as the answer, please, please, please read option C and D also. Bilateral body osteotomy of mandible to increase the vertical dimension of short face person. This is not a body osteotomy. This is body osteotomy. This is not body osteotomy. This is a ramal condylar procedure. So this is wrong. And none of the above is also wrong. So B is the answer. Okay. Next question. The biology behind this device is. Now option A very conveniently. The examiner may give distraction osteogenesis and you will mark option A and you will be wrong because the theory is not just osteogenesis but histiogenesis and that is what the examiner is wanting to ask. In exam, he didn't ask distraction osteogenesis because he made the option easy for you. If you would have given distraction osteogenesis as option A and distraction histiogenesis as option B, then it would have been a tough question. This is easy. It is not contraction. It is not compression. It is not rigid external fixation. Very easily you can answer distraction histiogenesis. But between osteo and histio, you have to the biology is histiogenesis because you are not just uh, increasing the length of the bone, but all the attached hard and soft tissues are also enlarging they are also increasing in length so it is distraction histiogenesis okay so this completes everything in distraction osteogenesis there is a good overlap between distraction orthognathic surgery and fracture and tmj ankylosis so wherever there is an overlap we will definitely discuss that part again in the concerned topics